The St. Lawrence River, a vital artery for French holdings in the Americas. 30 feet high and 36 feet across, the walls of Louisburg jutted out of the New England coastline with a formidable certainty. A construction 20 years in the making and costing over six million dollars. This rocky testament to France's American empire would soon be brought to its knees by a war originating 5,000 miles away. It really is just incredible how this European war with its European causes and its European motives is able to reach its nasty hand over the Atlantic and just ignite the colonies. The War of Austrian Succession, though wide in scope and involved parties, can really be attributed to one event, Charles VI's failure to produce a male heir to the Habsburg throne. Those dissenting parties were ready to take advantage of the sudden weakness in political equilibrium. Conflict exploded across the European continent, but what would define politics in the colonies would be the catalyzation of a Franco-British antipathy into all-out war. News of war reached the French fortress at Louisbourg on May 5, 1744. A week later, the French mobilized, attacking a British outpost at Canso, Nova Scotia, and taking English prisoners. King George's war had begun. You see, enmity between French and British colonists was, was basically well established even before the declaration of war. In New England, you consistently see French uh, privateering undermining trade. And at the center of this is Lewisburg. Lewisburg becomes a real nuisance, especially from where it sits right on the water, threatening New England fisheries. Basically, the colony's life force. These colonists aren't fighting a European war. They take what's going on in Europe and decide, yeah, we want to fight too. Maritime interests felt especially endangered by the French strength at Lewisburg, a base for privateers who were essentially government-sponsored pirates. In addition, New England Protestants had a religious motive towards resisting the Roman Catholic French. But even though tensions flared, neither side possessed the means to engage in large-scale warfare. The element of surprise is pervasive in the quick, destructive raids that characterized King George's war. If we take Canso, for example, the settlement wasn't prepared for attack at all. It is quite possible that they didn't even realize they were engaged in any sort of conflict. What you really see in this war, contrary to what's going on in Europe at the time, is a lot of small-scale back-and-forth skirmishes. Native American raids took place along the New England coast and the northern border between the British colonies and New France for the entirety of the war. Along the border, attacks against Saratoga and Albany in the late 1745 forced the abandonment of nearly all northern British settlements. Along the coast, the French and their Wabanaki allies undertook their northeastern campaign throughout the summer of 1745, attacking forts and setting fire to towns. Truthfully, King George's war is largely insignificant and uneventful, a collection of typical Indian massacres. Except, that is, for the capture of the French stronghold Louisbourg, the Gibraltar of the North. Then, in 1745, William Pepperell starts proposing this insane idea. Let's take Louisbourg. Now, he only gathers up a couple laughs, no one really takes him seriously. Rumors amongst the French stronghold were pretty widespread amongst the colonists. But William Shirley, uh, governor of Massachusetts, decides there's actually potential value with this plan. So he says, all right, let's do this. William Shirley is what the expedition was looking for. He is able to secure marginal support from the Massachusetts legislature and proceed to recruit provisions and manpower from across the colonies. From Connecticut came 500 troops, from New Hampshire 450, Rhode Island provided a ship, New York 10 cannons, and funds poured in from Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Command of the combined forces was assigned to Pepperell. No longer a mere merchant, Pepperell set sail from Boston in early March, now in charge of over 4,200 soldiers and 90 ships. Here's where it all began. Oh, I'm so sorry bro. Word. You can just imagine this ragtag fleet of colonial vessels fishing boats, schooners, the like. Four huge English men of war, giant artillery ships, plowing through the waves. It was May 1st, 1745. Louisbourg sat on the brink of war. The French garrison, although knowledgeable of the attack, was poorly paid and lacked proper training. The December before, Swiss mercenaries had incited a mutiny. The fort was in poor condition and faced dwindling resources. For the next month and a half, the siege of Louisbourg was underway. British forces poured onto the Cape, setting up artillery with ease behind the low rises that covered the land behind the fort. 
Watching the demise of their prized fortress, the French sent a massive war vessel to recapture their fort. She was beautiful, this massive warship, 64 guns across the deck. Something you'd really think could take back Louisburg. At least the French thought so. But she was too outnumbered by the English fleet and was soon captured and under the control of England. Around this time, nearly 2,000 soldiers had died, and the French couldn't take more casualties. On the 17th of June, the fort had surrendered, and the British flag soon waved over the walls of Louisbourg. Over the course of the next several months, the French would continue to humiliate themselves trying to take back Louisbourg. Time and time again, the French fleet was turned back, first by storm, then by the death of the captain Danville. His successor would commit suicide. In 1746, the French fleet would finally arrive at Louisbourg, only to be captured by the British. It was a complete and utter failure. Louisbourg would realize itself to be a major bargaining chip in the post-war settlements. Determined to regain Cape Breton, Louis XV of France would cede Madras in India and remove French troops from the Low Countries in exchange for the restoration of their territory. In October of 1748, the two nations signed the Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle along with the other European powers to end the War of Austrian Succession and, more importantly, King George's War. The colonists have essentially fought their own war, with their own loss of life and economic damage. And they realize, at the end, they're still subject to Europe's rules. They don't even get to keep their spoils of war.